Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I'm going to be talking with an author, an author who writes detective stories. He has a running series right now. He's on book number two uh, about this detective who he has been creating since high school. Actually, he hasn't been creating it since high school. He came up with the idea in high school and his parents, they wanted him to do something else. So they tried to give him some other activities, maybe sports, something that's lucrative there. And he didn't really take to being in sports, but he took to being in martial arts. So he went into martial arts. And then later on after that, he went back into writing, started writing the story idea that he had in high school. We talk all about that. We talk about how the stories come along, the creative process. We talk about how he builds characters, uh, how he comes up with the idea for characters, tries to do all that, how he found a publisher, how he has people read his books, proofread them. He learned more of a process of how to capture the reader's interest in the beginning all this kind of stuff. It was a great conversation. So here is my interview starting right now. My name is Paul Leonard Williams. I'm an author. Uh, The title is Exploding Buddha and also Deadly Divinations. Okay. And now first I want to get into uh, while I was researching you and the most obvious part is uh, Paul Williams, much like myself with the name Tom Ray is a very common name. Yours, of course, also like mine is also attached to a couple of very famous people. One of them also being an author and one being the person who wrote Rainbow Connection. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, Which is why I go with Paul Leonard Williams <laughs> to differentiate myself. Yeah. That was very calculated. <laughs> <laughs> so growing up, that must have been an interesting, although not a lot of people know that he wrote that song. He was in Cannonball Run, though. Anyway, this isn't the other Paul that, Williams. But that, no, that was. That was exactly. I, was all, I would get that all the time. I was uh-huh. all, Paul Leonard Williams. Um, I'm not the small, short, blonde guy. Um, mm-hmm. It was back when I had long flowing lo- locks. So I was, I was, <laughs> I'm tall, dark, and handsome. Right. Um, uh, there was also a, a guy in a soap opera that was, uh, or a character of Paul Williams. Oh. Uh, I, my mom watched soap operas, and so she would she would get that a lot. I didn't, but. <laughs> right. I had one summer where I watched them. Uh, I was just, I thought it would be a funny thing. And, uh, I was getting into them, but then it really was like, I was just doing a thing. Like then summer ended and I never watched soap operas again, but I watched it like one year. I watched days of our lives. Um, weird side story there. And, (laughs) but the, uh, the other thing too is, um, there is an author named, named Paul Williams. So how does that work with, uh, being an author? And then also there being an author, like I, I'm an animator and there was a famous animator called Tom Ray who did the Tom and Jerry cartoons and a lot of the Hanna-Barbera stuff. So, um, have you, have you run into that, you know, like, uh, having another author out there with your name? Like, actually that would probably benefit you, wouldn't it? It'd be like, are you, I was, it was not a concern of mine because when you actually do the searches, I'm branding myself as Paul Leonard Williams. True. And so that's what's going to come up if you do a search. Yeah. So I'm very deliberate in doing that because not that I claim to know anything about SEO, um, but that's outside of my wheelhouse. But I'm told that, hey, what, what you put in the search is going to, if you put in Paul Williams, you're down the list. But if you put in Paul Leonard Williams, you're the first guy who pops up. Yeah. So. And so I'm now Paul Leonard Williams. Yes. <laughs> Which is your middle name, of course. It's you, you didn't just pick a second name at random. It's it's probably your Correct. actual middle name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what type of what so what type of uh books do you write? Now tell us a little background on the stories that you create. They're urban fantasy. And um it, the the series, the Gideon Jones series, he's um a private eye who will take cases with a supernatural element to him. And so um, that's thus the urban fantasy. Uh, the, the first book is his kind of introduction to the world of supernatural. And that sets it up for the rest of the series where that's that those are the kind of cases he's going to take the central character. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you do have a running character that go throughout the books that you've done. Yes. Okay. How did you, um, come up with this idea to write this particular thing? Like, why did you choose it? Why, you know, how did it all begin? So I love, I, um, I love this because the opening line, the hook Mm -hmm. actually came to me my senior year in high school. And it's, I knew it was time to leave town when the Buddha exploded. That is very rarely a good sign. 
And so it's the last week of high school. Everyone's ta- talking about graduation. I'm telling them like, oh, my, the opening line of my book just came to me. I'm like, what book? I don't know yet, but <laughs> it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Wait, so the and, last week um, of high school, you're like, I'm going to write a book. Is yep. is basically what happened. Okay. All right. Continue. <laughs> um, and I, I've always been writing. Um, stories have always fascinated me. I was putting, uh, as soon as I learned how to read, um, I was writing stuff, even if it was crayon and paper. And I think um, that scared my parents. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, he's really entertaining this idea. So they sat me down almost like an intervention and convinced me that writing was a good way to starve. So my parents um, almost had an intervention. They sat down and, and, and talked with me and convinced Wait, an me. an intervention? That, because you wanted yeah. to write a book? They're like, this yeah, kid, they, they he's going that nowhere. That was a good way to starve. Okay. All so, right. Um, and they're not completely wrong. It's not like <laughs> being an author right. is immediate income. And so they came from a place of love, but it kind of it sidetracked me for the longest time. And so there's this big gap between the original idea, uh, but it was always there. It was always percolating. Okay. And so when I did um, decide that this is what I, something I'm going to do, I had that beginning. Um, but uh, Gideon Jones, to me, just sounded like such a badass name. Uh-huh. Uh, I was like, that, that, that sounds to me like a private eye. And so that's, that's where you go. You, you really get into character development. Okay. And um, because I don't care how, you know, neck deep in alligators they are, unless your reader cares about the character, Mm -hmm. they don't care. And so I needed to fall in love with my characters first. And that's kind of how I start. I I develop my characters and have a very rough outline line of how I want the story to go. Mm -hmm. But I understand that it's very, it's very fluid. And um, like I said, I sit down and, and I, I have these characters and I put them in situations and I don't know where it's going. I kind of write to see what happens. Yeah. Um, which I'm sure scares my publisher quite a bit, but <laughs> do, you have, do you have a character Bible? i like, how do you, how do you do a char- I guess I don't know how to do a character study. The only example I have is I'm sure I, I must have taken like a creative writing course in high school or something. Um, and it's, it, I, I vaguely remember they'd be like, write down these things and I did it and then I passed and then moved on. And I guess I never really thought about like, how do you create a character like you have and build that, uh, especially just from a, a a one line that you thought of in high school. <laughs> so uh, how, how did you build out this character? So you draw like Gideon's definitely an amalgamation of different things. And I, and I tell people like, he's, he's a little bit Jack Burton from big trouble in little China. He's a little bit okay. Mike Hammer from Mickey, Mickey Spillane. That. And that's what you do. You go in, you go, you go into your, into your head. And um, at least I do and go, who do I like about this character? Uh, now, what would I do to make him relatable to me? Cause mm-hmm. if he's relatable to me, he'll, I'm, he'll, you know, I'm human. He'll be relatable to humans. Cause I very much, uh, don't like the 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 tropes, the stereotypes where, you know, the hero has all the money and he's he's good looking and he's smart and he's fast and he's perfect. No, I want a flawed character, uh, so he has an arc and um, he can grow and and he's relatable mm-hmm. and um, like you know he's Gideon Gideon is strapped for money. He's he's behind on bills. He's he's had to take out uh, a loan with a loan shark. Okay and. Um, you know, and so, and people, I, at least I can relate to, to like, uh oh, I got, I got to juggle bills and stuff like that and right. pressure and, and, uh, he's flawed. He's a, he's, um, uh, he's, a, I, mean, I try to think of eighties and make it bigger than life kind of thing. But like, um, I, Jim you know, Rockford is the first thing that jumps to mind for me, but the, I don't know. It, yours seems to, from the trailer I saw, maybe have a little bit more style, but you know, this, <laughs> I, I'm a huge Jim Rockford fan. So I'm actually in the middle, I, or I'm actually almost at the end of watching the series for like the 10th time. Um, nice. <laughs> but I am a fan of the detective genre. It's I, I want to say from the cover, I wanted to say that I expected there to be maybe a super el, uh, supernatural element of the character. I don't think there is if, unless I'm mistaken, like not it, there. He's not like a shadow type character where, where he has no. like some sort of just like random super power ability that they just throw into the story. And that's, and that's what I want Cause he's very much, um, 
a badass. Gideon is right. a badass. He's he's a martial artist. He's he's a good shot. He's he's uh, you know tough as nails, hard boiled detective. And yet, because of the cases he's taking, he's in over his head. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's street smarts, a good right hook in a forty five, good enough against demons and dark magic. Yeah, and that's and that's what we're. Um, that's that's what I mean. It's it's okay for like the people that he's up against to have some sort of supernatural thing going on, but it's it's always cool to have the character just be a normal guy. It's like why did everybody else get to be all supernatural or deal with black magic and stuff like that? Uh, <laughs> but it makes it better. It's I don't know. That's in my opinion. <laughs> I think it makes it better. So so your parents wanted to give you an intervention. You said no, and you decided writing anyway. Now, how long did it take you to write your first book? That's just it. I said, yes. I said, okay, I was a good little boy. And, oh, you did. Oh, oh, oh. And oh, put that on I the back shelf. That. So I didn't, I didn't pursue my writing career till much later in my adult life. Okay. Cause that was going to be my next question is like, why did it take you so long to write the first book? Okay. So you didn't. And then I, I assume that this leads to, uh, you, you were con or you were sent to me by the person who was publishing your book. And one of the things he said is that, uh, you're a martial artist. And I'm assuming that that's what you did for a while. It's not not to fill in the story, but I'm going to say that's probably true. So why don't you tell me about that? You you became a martial artist. So uh, how did that come about? Um, so uh, I've that's 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 kind of what they love to plug about the books is is that because there's ninjas <laughs> in the books, and and they're like you're a real life ninja because the 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 system that I most recently studied in is Toshindo, oh. which is 21st century ninjutsu. Okay. And, um, so um, <laughs> your, your, traditional, <laughs> your traditional ninjutsu, you got to remember this was founded, uh, evolved like in the 14th century where they were fighting samurai in heavy armor. Yeah. And that's not an encounter that a 21st century American is likely to run into. So they kept the principles, but they didn't make it focus it around stuff that wouldn't be applicable today. They wanted it to be a live growing thing. And so um, I, I fell in love with it because most of your martial arts tend to be f focused in one area. Like your jujitsu is focused on groundwork, your taekwondo kicks, your judo throws, and ninjutsu has a little bit of all of that. And so um, I, I've, I've always been, I, uh, since I was a little kid watching Bruce Lee, that fascinated me. And, and, um, and so I, I, I taught and instructed martial arts. And when I was writing the books, um, one of the things that bothered me when I picked up a book and there was a fight scene, it would be like, he punched, he kicked. Mm -hmm. Well, what kind of punch, what kind of kick? And so it was one of the things that I wrestled with was I wanted to, when there was an action scene, I wanted it to be much more um, detailed than that, but it had to be an action scene. If you get too mired down in details, then you lose the the rhythm and the momentum of the thing. So I had beta readers that I that were martial artists that were moms and had no idea what a left hook was versus a right cross. So I could get some feedback on that. And, um, it, I found the, I found my happy medium, how I could where regardless if you had a martial arts background or not, you're like, okay, I know I saw in my head clearly what was going on. And, um, but martial arts go, oh, I know what technique he did or so. So you took the course just for, you know, to, as a thesaurus. <laughs> yeah i was because you should draw you should draw from your own experiences yeah no yeah. i, I you, like that um, though that's what i'm saying like you i get that that makes total sense it's just kind of funny you also get to learn how to fight in the process too so you know you'll again <laughs> learning from experience that's that's pretty funny <laughs> i never thought of that <laughs> and you said you had beta readers how do you find beta readers i guess i've never really thought about that when when you draw a comic i mean uh, it, like I do, it's like, I just put it out there. I don't think like I should run this by people. You're writing something that's like a big long, like somebody has to sit down and, and read it sort of thing. So it's like, let's run this by a few people and see if there's anything I need to fix. So how do you find beta readers for a book? Uh, so for, and that's, and I, I've, I've whittled it down to, I really just have two now that I oh, okay. trust. That makes use. sense. But at first, uh, um, you know, th from talking with people, uh, oh, I'm an avid reader. Oh, are you? What kind of stuff do you read and stuff like that? And I was like, oh, I'm an author. And that will come up like you have so many people. You'd be surprised when you say I'm an author. Oh, I've always wanted to be an author. Oh, really? OK. And so maybe this is a potential beta reader. And you mm -hmm. start talking and stuff like that. And so um, 
And what I found out was because I wanted a broad segment. I didn't want to be pigeonholed to like, I'm, you know, I'm looking at 20 to 30 year old martial artists to read my book. I was like, oh, no, uh. <laughs> I want to appeal to a much wider segment. Uh, so I kept that in mind. And I found out that most people, um, you know, life gets in the way. Oh, yeah. And so but uh, but uh, I there was I had a big enough pull and I had enough feedback and I, I asked specific questions that um, I figured out. And now I've just got it down to 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 two two beta readers that I trust. And and um, and, but, I, and and I'll go I'll read to my wife because um, uh, and, and I'm sure uh, just poor, I, I love her dearly. She supports me so much and I'm sure it drives her nuts because I I will read rewrite after rewrite. And I think it all blends together. But she uh, she's terrible at poker. And so I can, she's, an easy, she's an easy read. I can read oh, her okay. face. I got go, you. Ah, right. okay. I was like, hey, did you just change subjects on me? But I yeah, get what I you're saying now. I do that. <laughs> They're like, how is that? How's poker playing? She, she's got a terrible poker face. And so that's what I want when yeah. I'm reading it live to live to, to get that reaction. Oh, okay. There, there's actually an interesting interview I saw with uh, Quentin Tarantino, who said a very similar thing. Like he said, he's always reading his screenplays to his friends and they'll like try to tell him like, what's this or that? And he's like, no, no, no. I'm just reading this to see, you know, to one, he goes, he's reading it so he can listen to it out loud to see if it sounds stupid instead of like on the page. So he can kind of just, He's he's kind of thinking of it out loud. And two, it also is because when they do bring something up, he's like, OK, obviously I lost them there for a second. So I have to figure out why, you know, and that's yep. it's a very similar thing. So I I've, very, I very I can see where you why you would go with that. But how do you find the ones that you did find? Like, did you put out an ad or like, do you like oh, are no. they people you know? I wanted okay. to make sure that no, I there were people that I that I knew. Okay. All right. They were, they were people you knew. I, that's what I was curious yeah. about. I don't know if it's like that you put up a flyer in a coffee shop and go, hey, want to read a book and tell me about it? You know, which maybe people do. I don't know. <laughs> I, I haven't I, um, written a book. <laughs> no, I, I, there's, there's some validity in that, but I wanted to be able to be in constant contact with them and, and yeah. their brain. And of course. Yeah. And the, uh, so you, you write the book and then how are you, after you've written it, and this is the part that I think is is difficult, especially since I'm not a writer and the whole process seems very, very overwhelming to me. Um, you write a whole book and now you're going to put it out there. Like, what do you do with it? Do you how did you start, especially when you did the very first one? Not I don't know if you started with the publisher that you had or if you were putting stuff out there first and then you found a publisher. Like, how were you? Oh, no, you you got to have a thick skin. You okay. get rejected a lot. Okay. <laughs> Um, I was very, very lucky in that I had a friend who used to be in the industry and what he did was he was a screener. Okay. And so he oh, was maybe. the guy that, that decided, you know, does this go in the circular file or, is, or do we want to pay this attention? And so he told me some wonderful things that, that really helped me out. Like, first of all, you, I mean, you got to grab their, their attention, the reader's attention, the screener's attention, the publisher's attention, um, in the, in the first two paragraphs, if, 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 if you haven't, you're probably not going to make it past the first page to the second page and you, you're, you're forgotten about. And so I had some wonderful inside tips that your average Joe bag of donuts doesn't have. Um, and like, in fact, I almost stopped because when I was first writing this story and I was hand, um, to people like, uh, uh, I have, uh, there was a, a friend of mine who was a, t a teacher and literally took out the red pen and was like, circle and stuff. And mm -hmm. I had another friend who's a grammar Nazi and, and he's like, uh, it hurts me to read this. And now I've since learned, like, you don't, I wouldn't hand my first draft to my worst enemy. You have to understand that's a first draft. Mm -hmm. There's line editors for a reason. And for me, and I fell into this trap of I'd edit as I went and that was horrible and I was getting no traction. And so uh, you, you learn things out. And now I've, I, I've, I've found out that I have to just write. And, and if I use really horrible tropes or stereotypes or it doesn't make sense or terrible punctuation or, or whatever, I don't, I'm not focused on that. I'm focused on writing. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go back and now I'm a, I'm a, I'm a ferocious self editor and I look at stuff and then I, I, I polish that. And then I'd let my, my, um, my line, my line editor look at it. And, um, and he was my first line editor. And so we developed this uh, relationship of work because what he did was 
I was, t I was telling him about the ideas of my book and he was like, Oh, that sounds fantastic. And he, and he came in one day and goes, Oh, how's your book coming along? It's, t it's horrible. It's terrible. I'm not good at this. <laughs> he goes, what do you mean? And so I told him, well, I showed it to, to, you know, Susie and Susie took the red pen to it and I showed it to Joe and Joe said it hurt his brain. And, he goes, <laughs> and so he said, I don't want to read it. I want you to read it to me. Okay. And so I did. And he went, Oh, you're a fantastic storyteller. He goes, you just need a line editor. I'll be your line editor. And so we got into this thing where I'd, he'd have me read it to him first before he edited it. So he could get um, uh, a picture in his own head. And he told me later, he goes, yeah, because I would get when I would read this stuff, like there's characters, there's a character, Father Dominic, who is from Northern Ireland. And so he'd be going after we were no longer able to meet and I read the stuff to him personally before he would look at it. He's all, when I would read this, I, I heard Father Dom's voice in my head. I heard Gideon's voice in my head. And, and so that was a wonderful relationship to have while I was kind of learning. Um, the, so he, it was easier for him to, to know what I was going for when he, when he was editing it. Cause then yeah. uh, he was never a content editor. He was a line editor, but. What's the difference between difference. the two? I guess I don't know. Oh, okay. So your line editor just makes it uh, flow grammatically. Your content editor would be like, um, this needs to be cut out of the story or why did you do this with this character? Let's move it here and there. And so, um, and that's another thing you have to, uh, to, uh, how do I say this? You have to, uh, the tough skin, you can't be married to an idea. There's, uh, oh, I think yeah. a lot I would of imagine. first time, uh, authors who like they get this to them and and they get feedback and and then they're like well no I, that's my story don't mess with my story you're never going to get published then yeah um <laughs> and so and i get it it's your baby uh but um you know you have to you have to look at it like well do, do are you writing these stories for you or are you writing these stories so other people can read them yeah and they're they're looking at it from i want to make money and um you know they wouldn't give, they wouldn't give you this suggestion um, if, if it was, it didn't have merit, that doesn't mean it's etched in stone. Like I, I, I had a, uh, an editor once tell me, well, um, why did you, why didn't you describe them more? Like, cause I, I used something very, uh, very brief and I was like, well, what did you get from that? And then he goes, well, like, I was like, what do you mean? Well, why didn't you say that the person was blonde haired and, and pimply and stooped? And I was like, did you get that from my little thing there? Well, yeah, well, that's why. Right. Um, it's the less you is don't more. play. Yeah, exactly. Less is more. And that's, that's something you got to figure out when you're writing too, is um, um, the reason books are so, so popular is, and everyone likes the book more than the movie because they had their own theater running in their head. Yeah. And so if you give them just enough, they'll paint their own picture. I tried really hard to give vague descriptions of Gideon mm -hmm. because I want Gideon to look like, how you want Gideon to look like. Hmm. It's kind and of like so, the author or the, uh, the artist not explaining the painting too much or even giving it a vague title because it's like, well, what does it mean to you? You don't want to go like, well, I'm going to, you're completely wrong. And the thing that you connect with isn't true. You know, you don't want to do that. Um, th yeah. It's, it's, and also getting along with that, you said um, you, you had mentioned you want to capture the reader at the beginning, which must be very tough because it's like there's so many pages involved. But how do you capture a reader in the beginning that you said you had learned a, a way that you should go about doing that? Like, how does one go? Oh, about yes. Doing that? Yeah. Because you got to remember that now that we have uh, society has a very much microwave mentality. Oh, yeah. You know, um, uh, you can't if you look at books, um, we'll, say, we'll say the 18th century, you had tons of character development before mm -hmm. the story started happening at all. You cannot do that. If you don't catch their attention from the get go now, um, next. So, right. Um, but every book can't do... just start with explosion, bodies flying now on with the story, you know, or can it, I don't know. <laughs> it should start with something like that. Yeah. Because I mean, you want them to go like what's going on, mm -hmm. but if you don't have a fleshed out character that you can create an emotional tie to that will only take you so far. Yeah. So you first and foremost has to be the characters, um, but you can't develop that. So you have to have a fully developed character in your head and you have to slowly get the reader emotionally involved 
but uh, you have to pique their interest immediately. Okay. Um, that's just the nature of the beast nowadays. So that's, that's why, even though I had no idea what was going on, it resonated with me back in high school. I knew it was time to leave town when the Buddha exploded. Right. I mean, like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> you have the reader's attention right there. Uh-huh. Like the hook for, for, um, my, the, it the is third what inspired you to right start now. the whole thing in the first place and then still yeah. hold on to it years later. Okay. All right. So, all right. Now we're talking, we've talked about the thick skin and put, uh, but what plate, like, were you putting it out there personally or were you put it, were you shopping it? Like, how were you promoting it? I guess. Uh, so we've, we've talked about the rejection and the buildup and the things you've learned, but how were you actually getting the word out there about your book? Like what methods were you using? So, uh, once, once I, once the book was out there, um, I've been, uh, I've been trying to like to do things like uh, YouTube, TikTok, mm-hmm. um, like one of the sticks that I try and do is focus on how am I different than your other? Well, I, there's not probably a ton of authors who are also martial artists. Mm-hmm. And so I have videos uh, out there that are going to be like, Hey, um, these fight scenes aren't made up. These are real techniques. Let me show you what they are. Oh, and you so do show the them dojo and showing things. And so um, that's something that I haven't seen another author do and something that uh, I think would differentiate myself. And so people, and, and you know, and, and you have somebody who's, you two being martial artists and then there's a, Oh, he's got a book. I want to check this book out. Right. And so just little things getting out there. Um, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'd rather be a motivation, motivated mess than um, have analysis paralysis. <laughs> <laughs> You'd rather be a motivated mess. And I was like, wait, did I just hear him? Right. Okay. Yeah. You want to be a motivated mess. All right. No, I get that because, though. <laughs> because um, if you're, if you're dedicated, um, there's no such thing as failure. It's mm-hmm. just a uh, learning process and growth. Okay. And how did you find the current publisher that you're going through right now? Um, so um, basically uh, my friend that I, I mentioned who was in the industry, he said, Hey, submit it to these guys, submit it to these guys, submit it to these guys. Okay. And so, uh, but I, I um, how do I say it? I really very much. And I think everyone has to take the, th- when it comes to submitting, Th- submit it to everybody because you don't know don't don't have preconceived ideas like well maybe these guys uh aren't looking for this time type of book because they'll tell you hey uh that we're we're i don't know we're looking at romance authors try try this publisher mm. they'll tell you okay um sometimes sometimes they won't but um don't make that decision don't prejudge i yeah. say submit it to everybody submit it to everybody um, I love my publisher. They're a smalling publisher and that comes with pros and cons. But one of the huge pros is that, um, I'm very much involved in, in the creative process. Like oh, good. I, I, um, I got to, to show them, um, an artist that I found on, um, where did I find Wendell? Um, deviant art. And I said, oh, okay. I really love this artist. Um, you know, can you reach out to him for the cover? And they're like, absolutely. And that's, some, that's, that's a courtesy, a bigger publisher wouldn't like, no, you're the author. You don't worry about that. Mm-hmm. So, um, there's, there's some great things about that, but, and I, and I love my, my, my covers <laughs> yeah. uh, because if people like say, don't judge, don't judge a book by its cover. That's, that's a metaphor for people. Right. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> absolutely. That's what gets your attention in the bookstore or when you're going on Amazon, like, Oh, what's that? Let me, let me, that's what they see first before they see the dust cover. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, there was, there was a time period where, uh, comic books were doing that. They were hiring painters to paint a cover. The inside of the book looked nothing like it, but they'd have this really cool, elaborate, like watercolor digital painting on the cover and people would buy it for that. And inside it was just you know, same old, same old, <laughs> you know, yeah. very, very true. And it worked for, for a while, but yeah, no, it's, and, um, how do you, uh, do you express the story to the person that's making the cover and then they run with it or do you work with it? Like what's the process for actually, uh, so I'm very blessed in that respect. And that, okay. that, uh, Wendell Sauza is the artist who does my covers and he's really wonderful to work with and I'll give him ideas. And so, and we, we go back and forth on, on um uh, on the internet saying okay here's what i'm thinking here's what i'm looking for let me take a picture of a little sketch i've done and he'll go oh okay i mm-hmm. see it and then he'll come back with me about this look like, oh, 
that's magic. Yes, that's what I was going for. Or he'll, he'll say like, mm, how do you like one of the things for my covers is you're always going to see a fedora and a 45 okay. somewhere in the cover because that's Gideon. Okay. And so the first cover, he's like, do you want these floating in midair? How's that going to work? <laughs> right. And so like, I didn't think about that. OK. And so um, so I have that back and forth with him. But um, yeah, it's. I, I do have an idea of what I, I, I'm looking for, and then he brings it to life. Okay. And again, that's not something that uh, a lot of uh, authors get. They're, they're like, if it's if it's a bigger publisher, they're like, yeah, that's nice. You're the author. You worry about the story. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have the cover. Like, I remember uh, going back again um, to Jim Butcher with the Dresden Files. His his main character wears a, um, a duster. And, um, and someone asked him like, oh, so why, why is your character have this cowboy hat? He's really Western and goes, uh, he doesn't just in the covers that I had nothing to do with the picture. <laughs> <laughs> and so the artist said, oh, if he's got a duster, he's going to have a cowboy hat. And so on the covers, he has this hat and, and duster. And so, but that's not how, that's not how the artist envisioned it to look like. So. Okay. All right. And now you have two books you said, uh, before yes. two books and that's through the publisher that you had found. Correct. Okay. Now, over how many years have you been? Did those two books take? So, uh, it, close to four okay. years, and that's that's. See, that's the uh, part I don't. I I can't wait that long. <laughs> how do you do well, it? Well, <laughs> so what happened was um, there was a huge delay in the release of my second book because of COVID. Okay. Um, so, uh, the, the printer that we used really it threw uh, a monkey wrench and stuff. And so it was a lesson where, um, for a while there, I got mired down in depression. Like I, I had the second mm. book and I had these hopes and dreams and nothing really happened with it. And then you just, you got it. Like I said, if you're dedicated, there's no such thing as failure. You just keep on keeping on. And so now I'm more than halfway through with my third book. And so now that the second one's available for, for pre-order, and um, I, I believe that when it's going to be available for purchase is going to be uh, May 31st. Okay. Uh, well, I'm already more than halfway done with the third. So I have a momentum now for my third book that I hadn't thought about before. And so uh, don't – life is going to happen. It happens oh, yeah. to me constantly. It happens to everybody. <laughs> uh, don't let that sidetrack you. Mm -hmm. Don't let that sidetrack you. Because uh, I, when I talk to to people, we're like, oh, I'm – I. I wanted to be an author, uh, but, mm -hmm. and then are like, what do you do to get around writer's block? And, um, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to lie and say that there's days where it's really hard to write. Um, but uh, it's an excuse. Every mm -hmm. like, no, no. Um, you couldn't call your, your boss and say, I can't come into work today. I have worker's block. Right. Um, <laughs> You got. You have to uh, assign it that type level of priority, mm -hmm. and so I had to be disciplined, and I had to carve myself out some time where I say, "This is when you write." Mm -hmm. And um, if 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 you fall off from that, you fall off from that. But you have your standard. Uh, it was something uh, I don't remember who the author was, um, but he basically said, "If you want to differentiate yourself from ninety nine percent of the authors out there, be able to meet a deadline." Mm, okay. And I was like, hmm. Then that hit home with me. And I was like, why is that? And I was all, because it's, you know, it's the, the artist mentality. You have a different mindset and things like that. And I was all, yeah, you still have to earn a living, right? Yeah. You make time for what's the higher priority. So if you give it that level of priority and carve out that amount of time, uh, you get way more done. I found out. Okay. And when you put out a book, it, it, I was thinking of this when you said you're working on a third one, like the, the way I kind of pictured it is like uh the old model for like musicians what they do is they released an album and then they tour with it you know it, it, they go out and go to the di like what do you do when you release it and then you go okay on to the next one like i guess what's your process do you travel with the book do you uh, is there so again that is something that is that is going to be happening now yeah because covid's no one's worried about that before. So I do right. have book signings and stuff going on. Okay, good. Uh, but, but I didn't at first because this right. whole, I mean, I, you know, who plans for a worldwide pandemic, that kind of <laughs> uh, everyone, that, we were all prepared. You're unprepared. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and, I, and I look at it now like, well, Hey, that's a blessing in disguise because 
um, when you, there's something magical, I'm told that happens from the release of your third book that spikes the sales of your first two. Really? And, okay. Um, that that uh, and I'm not sure why. Maybe they're just like, oh, I, I mean, I'm I'm constantly honing my craft. I think your writing does get better, but um, I've had uh, like my 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 um my publisher has um approached uh, Netflix, and the first thing they told him is, look, uh, call us back when when he's got three books. Hmm. And um, so they're they're looking for that. Um, okay. So I was like, okay. So I was all, well, there we go. That just that just um, solidified for me that writing is the thing. Yeah. So uh, I, you know, uh, how do you eat the proverbial elephant one bite at a time? I've never you know, heard just, <laughs> that saying in my entire life, but I love that. <laughs> and so you just you keep writing. You know, uh, if if you figure out a rhythm, and if if you you know that you set this much time for writing, you'll get that much done. You'll carve it out, and you know. Um, it's 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 a lot easier to promote once you have books out. So okay. yeah, of course. <laughs> I got to tell I mean. myself yeah. keep that writing up because that's that's uh, you know life happens like I said constantly and and it kind of sidetracks you. But if that's your laser focus, there's a difference. Okay. And I'm not saying I don't fall off fall off the wagon. It happens. Yeah. Um. But but if you make it a priority, uh, it's you know it's. Just, Life is different. When you do get back out there, what type of um, events or places or signings, uh, like what's what would be the type of things that would be connected with it? Like, I guess I'm I'm curious to see what, uh, yeah, like what what sort of I'm tr- well, I, all of a sudden the word escapes me. Uh, what sort of background? No, not background. Like, say, would they be like uh, sci-fi conventions or horror conventions or, you know, like there are all those types of conventions. Like what type of uh, sort of thing would your book go well with? Yeah, um, so, yeah, th- that's very much like things like um, very much like things like Comic Cons, but also okay. just like mom pop book signings I've, uh, yeah. I've done as well. So and like location, like my my um, editor um has me for for fall i'm going to be going to new mexico why because the second book takes place in new mexico oh fun um and then in come winter i'm going to be going to san francisco something i couldn't do for the release of the first book because you know it's taking place in san francisco yeah and so um um so if you're writing a book write about somewhere warm because that's where they'll send you <laughs> <laughs> well my publisher is awesome in that respect yeah i, I can't speak for other publishers okay but, um Oh yeah. Okay. So uh, that's interesting because my third book is taking place in Scotland. I've always wanted to do a castle tour of Europe. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Maybe not warm, but I've always wanted to go there. I was thinking South Bayfont America, but yeah. I times, and so I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, he did the accent. I love it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And that's because uh, I do see a lot of uh, different events that I go to. I'll see people with books and it's, um, I love the fact that conventions have gotten a lot more um, they've expanded a lot in what's there rather than just like even comic cons themselves are more like you see crafters and creators and, um, and book writers, but, but book writing to me, I feel that goes hand in hand with comics. I think people love a story. I mean, you don't read the comics Absolutely. mainly for the drawings. There's, there's people don't argue online. Well, they do argue online over the artwork of a superhero, but they argue more about the storyline of a superhero. You know, they have their favorite artists, but they also, yeah, I mean, you mess Comic-Con with that story, what I, you know, <laughs> got me writing again. Really? Is, uh, yeah. I, um, cause remember my folks had convinced me that's, that's how, uh, I, I wish I would starve if I did that. Okay. And, um, I, I had, um, an ex who, uh, would go to Comic-Con and, um, she was also an aspiring author and her genre that she really loved was romance. Um, and there was these two breakout sessions uh, that had two different authors. One was Jeannie Koch, her favorite author. And the other was an author she didn't know, mm-hmm. but the, uh, the topic was something that she was really interested in how to write a novel in 31 days. Okay. And so she said, please go to this and take copious notes as if I was there and take it serious, please, please, please. And that way I, I don't feel out like I missed it entirely. And so I did what she asked and that's how I got like the, the author was Michael Stackpole, uh, who's okay. really um, best known for writing inside of the star Wars universe. Oh, all right. Um, 
his his probably most successful book is called I Jedi, which of course is a play on Isaac Asimov's I Robot. <laughs> My favorite book of his is In Hero Years I'm Dead. I like that one way better. <laughs> hmm. It actually reminds me a little bit about uh, the the story from um, of my cut. Uh, you know, the the hook for my for my first book came in high school, and the the story for that um, book uh, title came when he was having a discussion about at family around dogs, and his uh, his nephew came up to him and goes, "What is dog ears?" And they explained it to him, and he goes, "How old are you in dog ears?" And he goes, "In dog ears, I'm dead." Yeah. <laughs> And that was the genesis for the title of his book, In Hero Years, I'm Dead. And um, what it really was, was 31 separate character development exercises. Huh. Um, but, you know, that's not as sellable as how to write a book in 31 days. Right. And I agree with him 100% that if you have all your characters fleshed out, that's that's the heart and soul of your book anyway. Yeah. And um, But it rekindled in me the desire uh, to do it. And so there was uh, something called NaNoWriMo. The idea is try and write um, the majority of a book in 31 days, which mm -hmm. is a very tall order. You find out if you really apply yourself, you go, oh, wow, I can get much more done than I thought. Mm -hmm. This was a mental barrier that I can get through. And because um, the the people who actually write the, the 200 pages or however, like 50,000 words, or I'm not sure what the goal is, are few and far between. Um, but... Um, I, like I said, if you apply yourself to that, you'll realize, oh, you, that, you know what the, the recipe for writer's block is? Getting down and writing anyway. Yeah. And that's that was a huge thing where I said, if you have a schedule and every day you carve out this time for writing, you get stuff done mm -hmm. as opposed to making up excuses. Because we're all humans. It happens. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes um, when I know I need to draw something and I'm just like, oh, I just can't, I'll just start drawing something. And what I do is after I draw something that's horrible, I try to fix it <laughs> and then I'll elaborate from there. So I'll just start out knowing like, eh, I'm not even going to do this. And it's like, yeah, but no, oh, that's not right. What's well, I got to fix that. Well, then this per first part doesn't make any sense. And yeah. You, then you start tearing it up for parts. Yeah, I get that. Now w you said you were already working on a third book. So I just wanted to ask you, what are some of the things that you have coming up, including this book? And I want to say, I see a teaser for monsters or something on your site. Um, <laughs> yes. So, uh, so the, 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 the title for the third book is monsters mass. Mm. And, um, so it's, it's very much going on, on, um, the, the, the Catholic mass and how that's, um, a ritual really okay. a magic ritual that transforms bread and wine into the body and blood of a God that you then eat. Okay. So if you look at, at our actual mainstream religions, the, there's more mysticism than you think. And you look at that like, oh, and so um, without going too much in that book that uh, uh, it takes getting into Scotland. And what he's doing is he's um, he's trying to rescue uh, a friend who uh, Father Dominic, who's in this society called it's it's um, it's called the Order of St. George, which is a secret sect of the Catholic Church whose charter is to protect the lady from physical attacks like dark magic demons witchcraft of course and so day-to-day -day stuff um, <laughs> yeah and they're like the, the majority of our the majority of of the things we deal with in christians are spiritual but um there are physical things that that can be threats as well and that must be dealt with we must protect the flock mm -hmm. and so um that's how they're how they're looking at it and so um uh, that's that's why Monsters Mass and like Deadly Divinations takes place in New Mexico. And that's why I'm doing the book signs in New Mexico and and Monsters Mass takes place in Scotland. So I'm really looking forward to the book signings there. Like I said, I'm going to go and do a, a castle tour of, of Europe, maybe or at least Scotland. Right. <laughs> I know. Get on top of that. But um, <laughs> Yeah, you get these ideas and you run with them. And uh, uh, like um, like the one after that, I already, I already have a fourth book in mind oh and uh, that's going to be taking place in new orleans and have to do with voodoo and take um, that writer's block yeah <laughs> yeah and so you um you how do i say it the, you know um lombardi said winning is a habit it has momentum so if you let your if you let your imagination run and go with that momentum um see, see where it takes you mm -hmm. because the whole reason i write is when i was reading these stories transported me to a magical place. Okay. 
And what I want to do is I want to enable others to escape the mundane and partake in magical adventures. And that's my reason why. And if you have a reason why, life doesn't get in the way. Hmm. Um, and so that's just, you can focus on the obstacle or you can focus on your reason. Yeah. And so I have a reason to write. And so I, I refuse to surrender to the momentum of mediocrity. No, I'm go I'm going to help others escape the mundane with magical adventures. Well, hell yeah. And, <laughs> and so that's why I keep writing. And if people wanted to read this writing, where could they go about finding your book or uh, catching up on the first two? The The easiest place would be my website, uh, paulleonardwilliams.com. And they can buy it right from there. Yep. Oh, fantastic. And would you like to, or do you know some of the places you're going to be possibly this summer that you'd like um, to mention? Not yet. That's Those are going to be local here in the Phoenix area. So they should watch your, um, go to your Facebook group or, or your Facebook page or your website to check that stuff out too? Yep. Great. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking with me today. I'm so glad I got the chance to meet you. Likewise. It was a pleasure. 